sessions in between in the tea breaks. So let's welcome our next speaker on stage, is Marcel. Um, so Marcel works out of Zurich yep. and so is work, left and right. from the Go team. So, just this button, basically. so okay. now you know whom to go to with all of your language feature requests. Right, Marcel, that will work. That language is correct. Language feature requests, priority yeah. gets bumped up. Basically, base it, please, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, real world text in Go, the text repo. And uh, a, a, an in interesting thing about him that you can sort of ask him offline is he is part producer of a movie. Is that an accurate way yeah. to describe it? Yeah, just basically a small investment, but it's, uh, small investment. it's a nice movie. So you, mm -hmm. you have a movie producer. I'm going to exaggerate that, yeah. movie producer. So you can ask him about that offline. But in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah. Uh, can we have a hand for our speaker, please? <laughs> Yes, thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, attending. So I'm going to be talking basically about a text subrepo uh, of Go today. Um, it's maintained by the Go team, uh, primarily me and uh, part Nigel. And um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, what does it really do, what is it for, right? So that you know when to uh, use it and when not. Um, talk a little bit about the current status, but mostly I'm going to show you a bunch of examples. A bunch is a uh, scientific term we use at Google, as you might have noticed by now. A bunch of examples, and then um, hopefully get to the conclusion and, and make it clear to you that um, handling um, text is actually quite complicated, and uh, it might be best in your own best interest to use the text repo to take a lot of that complexity away from you. So what does the text repo do? What kind of packages are in there? So mostly it's packages related to internationalization and localization which are also two of the longest terms in computer science, I guess. So some examples of it are searching and sorting, um, all very language specific, uh, casing, bidirectional text handling, very complicated in its own right. Um, injecting translated text into your application, number formatting, unit conversion. So there are some things about internationalization that it does not cover. So for example, um, one thing you want to watch out for if you're doing translations or whatever is to not insult people. What's really funny in one language is really not funny in another language. Um, there's also all kinds of legal issues like I am not going to go into there. So no package called lawyer or anything like that. So you don't really have to see what's on here, but basically I have a bunch of groups uh, of, of functionality. It's overlapping. It's completely arbitrary, but um, there's a lot of packages. So um, in the text processing area, so transforming text from one kind of form to another, there's actually a lot of packages right now. So when it comes to um, localization or like sort of formatting values in a specific language, um, it's not very well, um, you know, like it's not very worked out yet. Uh, working on it, I ex expect a lot of the gray, grayed out packages to become white soon. Um, there's packages about string equivalence, which is a whole topic in its own right. Um, uh, I will show you examples of all these things later in the talk. So first, a little bit of Unicode refresher in Go. So Go is, um, uh, I think it's really the right choice, but Go uses UTF-8, right? Unlike uh, many other languages. So the nice thing about it is that ASCII remains ASCII, right? It's nowadays, it's the encoding of choice for the web, basically. Um, but one feature of uh, UTF-8, so actually, by the way, strings in Go do not have to be UTF-8. It's just that they commonly are. Uh, and if you range over a string in, in Go, what you will get is you will get uh, one code point. They're called rune in Go. It's the same thing, basically. One code point after the other, right? So basically, what, what happens is you jump into positions in a string. It's not one byte at a time. It's one code point at a time. And a code point can be anywhere from one to four bytes. So it's a variable length encoding. So some people argue, and a lot of, lot of languages that did not cho choose UTF-8, they basically did so because they want to have random access in strings. So basically, this is a pipe dream, right? There is no such thing as random access in strings. You, you can never sort of get the nth character within a string. It's, it's, at least if you try to do that, it's, it's not a very uh, good practice. So here you see a little um, example. If I'm right, uh, that says Canada in Canada. Maybe not, I was hoping, but uh, always three bytes per character, so quite consistent, that's nice. So here we, um, I'm trying to explain to you that text is inherently um, sequential and, and random access really makes no sense. So 
Uh, recently, Unicode added um, emoji flags, like kind of funny, right? Um, so, um, so what, you, what I'm trying to do here with, with this print statement, um, so I know that the emoji characters are in the high range of Unicode, so we're using four bytes here, right? So trying to skip the first code point, right? So what do you all think that this will print, right? So just take a moment to think about it. Uh, most people are kind of surprised by the answer. This is what it will print, the Russian flag, not the Korean, not the American flag. <laughs> so what's going on here? So really, um, flags are represented, uh, one code point for each letter in the country code that's represented by the flag. So basically, you have two uh, code points for one character, actually like physical character. So even at, Unico at UTF-32, right, you already do not have the single code point per character uh, situation, right? So what's happening here? We're skipping over the K, it becomes the R and the U, which is the, you know, the Russian flag. And then we have a gibberish S, which is uh, nicely represented by the S in the, this is actually a Unicode thing, S with a dotted box, right? If you don't have a full flag. So one thing which is uh, sort of breaking from Unicode tradition, what they always did is if you pick a random point in a string, you can always, within limited amount of space, you can backtrack to the beginning of the character. So with flags, this is actually not possible. Um, so basically, if you, have, you can have an unlimited number of flags in a row. And um, in order to know which flags you're actually printing, you have to go all the way back to the beginning, right? So uh, they realized they made a mistake, I guess. So in a later edition of Unicode, um, they try to say that you have to put a, in order to, to separate the flags, you have to put a character in between the two characters of the flag. I don't know who thought of that, but you know, it's a way to do it, I guess. And, um, but you know, since it's Unicode already supports this, you have to handle this anyway. So there's a bunch of reasons, this is sort of a fascist uh, example, but there's a bunch of reasons why you cannot do this. So you have, um, especially in European languages, Vietnamese, you often have like a single character that's composed of many code points, right? Uh, you have segmentation where you potentially have to backtrack a lot. Uh, even casing, right? If simple casing, like even upper casing, lower casing, you might have to consider a lot of context, uh, for example, in Greek, to even determine how you have to case a character, right? So transforming text. Uh, let's get to some examples. So one thing that's nice about this, so Go is very streaming oriented, and the fact that text is, um, is not random access sort of like fits right in there, right? So uh, you think about the reader and writer um, patterns. So Basically, in Go, we use this uh, transformer interface. We don't use reader. It's mostly for performance reasons. Um, but as a user, you typically uh, don't have to use this. This is like the deep dive gopher you see there. So don't pay too much into attention to it. As a user of the text repo, even though everything is called a transformer, you don't really have to know what it does. Um, so there is a transform package that if you implement a transformer, you can very easily uh, use that piece of code to create readers from it, string, uh, string converters or you know, like byte converters. So at the bottom, you see how it's typically used. So typically, every package has its own wrappers around these uh, lower level transform utility functions. So code will look something like, uh, like that, right? Like width, narrow, string, and then you pass it a string, and you get the narrow form of a string and stuff like that. So let's go to some examples. So normalization. So normalization was the first package that we uh, had in the text repo. So it's sort of a low-level thing, like typically you don't have to worry about it, but basically what it does, um, so in Unicode, you have, if you have a single string, it can often rep be represented in multiple forms or multiple ways. So Unicode defines normal forms that, you can, that allows you actually to map um, you know, a given string into one of the several normal forms. So of course there's not one, right? You wouldn't have expected that. So with the normalization package, you can use, uh, for, so, so what's very common, for example, is uh, to store files in the NFC form, which is a relatively compact form, right? Um, so in this case, it's a very good example, actually, where it would make a lot of sense to use a writer for your text transformations, right? Like if you, you can do all kinds of text manipulation, when you're done, you write it to a file in a you know, normal form, wrap your writer with a NFC writer, and you're done. So, you know, I thought this would, would be very nice. So this was already the first uh, major problem we uh, ran into. So basically, it turns out that in most uh, frameworks, you don't do this, right? And um, this was kind of a shock to me initially, but normalization is actually an n-squared algorithm, not linear, right? So if you try to do this, use this in a streaming context, right? You can easily blow up buffers and 
have all kinds of security issues, right? So uh, what to do? So what's the reason for this? So here you have a reason right here. So this is valid Unicode. So you see a whole bunch of accents. They're all applied to the E, right? Uh, and basically, you can have an arbitrary number of modifiers on any character. So you can even use the same modifier multiple times on the same character. That's actually valid. Some languages actually use that. Um, so really, um, you know, in order to normalize a string, you have to sort the, um, the modifiers on the, of the characters. So sorting is n log n, but not the way Unicode defines it. It's actually an n squared algorithm, which makes sense for the typical case. Um, so basically, there you have it. It's an n squared algorithm, right? But to the rescue, Unicode does have an escape. Uh, there is something uh, that's called stream-safe normalization. It's a slight adaptation to the algorithm. Um, turned out that nobody ever implemented it, so there were all kinds of issues with it. And basically, what I had to do is to redefine the semantics of some of the code points in order to make this work. Well, you can make it work, but to make it work securely, there's a lot of security issues if you don't take a, uh, pay attention. To make it secure uh, was a little bit tricky, especially in Japanese. I had to modify some things here and there. Um, usually, that doesn't matter. Uh, it's only for the purpose of normalization, right? So, like, uh, nobody will ever notice that I modified this. So there you have it. So Go actually has a linear normalization algorithm that you can use for your streaming. So that's the first, as far as I know. So another example, the cases package. So most people think of casing as something very simple, right? You just convert it to uppercase, lowercase. Um, but nothing is simple in Unicode. Like, you will learn that throughout this talk. So with casing, um, so many languages, especially in Europe, I think it's only European languages, they, they always want to do something funky with casing. So case in point from my own language, Dutch, right? If you want a case, a title case, the word um, uh, in Dutch, this means uh, iceberg, right? It looks, uh, the output will be something like this. So in Dutch, the apostrophe is actually a letter, considered to be a letter for this purpose. So the apostrophe is capitalized, right? Which actually doesn't change anything. So the N is not. Um, and then I and J is considered to be one letter, so you both have to capitalize them, not just the I, right? If any Dutch will see just the I capitalized, they will, you know, be very upset, basically. So, um, so I think Go is actually the only one that uh, does not capitalize the N in this case. So, I mean, it's the advantage of, like, having a native working on, you know, this kind of stuff. So uh, I filed a CLDR bug. CLDR is sort of the repository where all the data for this is stored. And uh, it doesn't fit into the casing model of Unicode. Uh, so quite frankly, right, if you speak to linguists about this, like, that's just nuts, right? Like, who would not case the N in this case? So, like, it's, uh, it's uh, that's just a little bit weird. But anyway, Go handles it correctly. So there's a whole bunch of other transformers in the, you know, like, right there. You don't have to read it. You can just go to the text repo. Um, you know, a lot of stuff there. So searching and, and uh, sorting. So here you're actually not manipulating text. Um, you would think it's a little bit easier in this case, right? But uh, to repeat the mantra, nothing is easy. I picked this picture because the, these gophers look all sorted. thought it was appropriate. So you, know, you don't have to go through all this list, but this is just some examples of why sorting and searching is difficult. So for example, code points with accents have a very different code point, right? They're not uh, you know, in order at all. So you have to handle that. Some languages, uh, so in Dutch, the IJ doesn't really matter, but in Spanish, the CH is really a different letter. You have to sort, sort that as if it were one character. Um, so a lot of languages have equivalences, like Danish, double A is an A, or the, uh, the S set in German being a double S. Um, so some languages, Danish has a lot of quirks. So Danish considers the A with a ring to be actually a separate letter. So you sort it after the Z, not near the A, right? But then you have other cases that are sort of the reverse, like the Calvin K is something really very different, but because it looks like a K and almost nobody can distinguish it, it's sort of nice to sort it next to a K to avoid surprises. Um, after that, it gets really, really funky. Like, um, so that, you know, you can say about what the French, uh, what you want, right? But at some point, they realize if something is really ridiculous, let's just drop it. So one of those things is accents, right? So everybody, like every single language, sorts from left to right, or basically in increasing memory order, if you will, right? Even in Arabic. Uh, but the French found it necessary to basically, even though most of it is sorted left to right, for accents, you sort right to left, right? So the French dropped it, but the Canadians are sticking to it, right? So have to support it. 
Uh, then you have just languages that are inherently complicated, like Tibetan, and I'm not even going to go into it. And for the locals here, the canadal vowel, vowel sign O is actually causing a problem. So very often when you get really into the code, right, you really see, uh, you, you get to feel the algorithm, if you will. You think like, oh, it seems like every character has a property that the algorithms haven't really used yet, right? So, um, so if I can just assume this property about Unicode, I can actually really optimize this algorithm. So, um, you know, practice tells me that basically there's usually one or two code points that do not adhere to this. So in the case of collation, that was the Canada foul sign. Oh, it's the only character. Uh, there's a comment in the code somewhere. Uh, but don't feel bad, right? This, is, this happens all the time. Like, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, nice to have. So search and replace. So a lot of people think like, well, okay, my language only does, or my application only does English. It's good enough, right? I'll just use byte search and replace. You know, it doesn't matter. Even in English, this breaks down, right? So let's say we are, um, you know, I write a report on my visit here, start writing on the first day. I went to a cafe, right? But then later it's like, well, actually, let's be honest with myself. I went to many. So let's just do a search and replace from a cafe to many cafes. So, um, so you see three example sentences here. So if I take the first sentence, everything handy dandy, like it works out. If I take the second sentence, uh, this is an alternative spelling, which is valid in English, where I use an accent on the E. Uh, it actually doesn't work, right? Because the E with the accent is a different code point. You know, so if you do a byte search and replace, it doesn't work. But what if my editor internally actually decomposes the characters and represents the accent differently? So then I actually would find a match, right? So I re replace a cafe with many cafes, everything nice. But what happens then? Uh, the accent actually is still there, but then it's applied to the S. Right, and you get something very weird. So even simple byte-oriented search and replace in English won't work. So to give you another example in, again, Danish. Um, so here you see a table, like on the left-hand side you see the search uh, strings, right? In the middle you see the text, that's the same for all the cases. And then you see the matches on the right. So this shows a few nice things about the search uh, package. So. Here I'm searching in Danish, um, I'm ignoring case, and I'm ignoring diacritics, which is really a fancy word for accents, but you know, linguistically speaking, it's not, so diacritics. So at the bottom you see some code to do this, it's not that important. So what you see here is that Aarhus uh, spilled lowercase with double A matches the Aarhus there, so even though it's a single A, um, in Danish the A ring is really double A. So that's a match, very nice. Um, so in the second string, it gets a little bit funky. So first of all, you can see it does not match a ring. Uh, the reason for that is that a ring in Danish is really a different letter, so you should not match it with a single a. Um, however, it Dutch does match the second a. Um, but the funny thing you see here is that it actually also matches the Unicode code points after that. So these code points are modifiers, right? So if you're doing any kind of text manipulation, by default, you really should do it as a character chunk at a time. There's exceptions, um, but usually you would want to, right? So here it matches the entire character, including all the modifiers. Um, the third one is also very example. So this uh, a very uh, interesting example. So this is a little bit unique to Go. Uh, for some languages, this happens automatically, but Go does this across the board. So the text that you see here is actually not normalized. Uh, the search string is normalized. So basically the byte sequence uh, is different, right? And the order of the characters is different. So the search package will automatically detect if a string is not normalized um, and then do the right thing, right? Uh, the detection is actually free. So it's, it's still very fast if the strings are normalized. So collate. Um, so collate here, we're comparing strings. Um, just a short example, right? If you want to sort these, uh, these three strings in a row, you just create a collate uh, instance uh, in this case for the root language. Uh, I'll tell you later what it is, maybe. And then you can sort the strings um, and you get the output as expected, right? It's uh, pretty easy to use. Um, so now to the next thing, language stacks. So you saw that in a lot of these examples, if you, if you noted, um, I passed something like language dot something in it, right, to initialize it. So that's, um, you know, the text repo's ways of telling I want a um, you know, value or like s some, some kind of instance of, uh, you know, for a particular language, right? So language stacks, you would think, are a little bit simpler, right? It's a, just an, a label, right? It's, a, it's made to be for computers, right? It's nothing to do with human language, or at least not directly. It's not a word. 
right? So you would think that's a little bit less complex. Uh, as I said, nothing is easy in Unicode, right? So what's a language stack? Here are some examples. So uh, Go uses BCP47. It was one of the first implementations, I think, of BCP47. So there's a transition right now to the standard, so like with, with pretty much any language. Um, so the label basically starts with the ISO language code. Then if you want to write a language in a non-default script, you can specify the script. If you want to have a regional dialect, you can specify the region. And for any other variants which you cannot encode by script or region, there is a variant encoding. Um, also, what BCP47 allows is to pass options. So for example, some languages have multiple sorting orders, uh, like German. So I can say, instead of the dictionary sorting order, I want the phone book sorting order. And you can specify that in your language tag. The language tag, is, uh, you can see it as a request for a certain you know, localization. So, Usually, language stacks are used to, um, to basically de define which language you want to have a UI in. Right? So the user specifies uh, one or multiple languages that he wants. And then your application supports a bunch of languages. And then you have to find the best language to match the user's preference. Right? That's the task, basically. Here. So again, this is non-trivial. Um, so to give you a few examples, I recently posted a blog. It gives a little bit more detail and a little bit more examples. Uh, on the Golan uh, block, but just to name you a few. So for example, um, if you have a Swiss German speaker and you request Swiss German, language code uh, GSW, uh, if you request German, that basically, um, or if you request Swiss German and you show them a German page, everything's fine, right? They can perfectly read it. And pretty much, I've met some Swiss Germans that do not speak uh, German, but pretty much everybody does, right? Um, so the converse is actually not true. So uh, if you present a Swiss German page, there are not many, granted, but if you do that and you present it to a German, he will not be able to read it, right? It's better to present uh, English, actually. Even if he doesn't speak English, probably, or she, it's probably better uh, to present English than Swiss German. Um, another one is uh, Mandarin Chinese. So everybody uses ZH for Mandarin Chinese. The official language code for Mandarin Chinese is CMN, right? So it would be nice if somebody is proper and requests CMN to actually show the Mandarin Chinese and not say like, oh, I don't know, I'll just show you English, right? That's kind of rude. Um, then there is a lot of political stuff like in Europe, right? Like there is, um, like somebody that speaks Croatian can definitely read Serbian if it's written in the Latin script, right? It's, it's very close. Um, oh, cozy. So, oh, battery power, right? I don't know. But, um, so, you know, you, you, it's, it's, it's just, you know, convenient. It's much better to show Serbian in Latin than to switch, you know, to English if somebody speaks Croatian. Um, then there's subtleties about, uh, for example, Angolan Portuguese is actually closer than European Portuguese, than Brazilian Portuguese. If you would do the, the simple thing of stripping, you know, just getting the language code, um, you know, you would not get an optimal result, right? It's not the big drama to show Brazilian Portuguese if somebody wants European Portuguese, but, you know, you can do better than that. So um, Go has a language matcher, um, which basically takes care for pretty much all of this. Um, so it has like all this information stored, basically, that's in the CLDR database uh, to do the right thing to the best of its abilities. So to use this, uh, I hope you guys can read this. There's a, you know, like some, so basically it takes three lines of code to, to uh, use the language matcher. So at first, you need to uh, create a matcher with basically a list of all the languages you support. Um, so you, know, you don't have to use it in an HTTP context, but this example uses HTTP, or assuming you're using a HTTP handler. So then you have to get the accept language header from your request, right, which basically can contain user uh, language preferences. Uh, you pass that to parse accept language, and it returns to you a list of languages that you can pass to the matcher and magically comes out the tag, right? So um, the tag that is returned might actually be a tag that's different from the tags listed in your supported languages. Um, so because it can carry over user settings. So if the user wants phone book setting, for example, in German, um, and you don't necessarily think about that, right? But you do support German. This setting is carried over into the tag if you subsequently pass this tag to any of the packages that will take over these preferences, right? Um, I don't know if there's any other framework that does this, quite frankly. Um, but um, yeah, I don't believe so. But maybe there is. So 
basically, I've hoped to have shown you that uh, dealing with languages is uh, trickier. Um, the complexity, you know, there's tons of examples. It goes much further, much deeper than this. But, um, you know, like the text repo, we really try to keep this uh, simple in Go style. Like, generally, you do not have to worry about normalization. You do not have to worry about uh, many other aspects of, of this. One of the, the tricky parts that might be good to mention still um, is, for example, if you want to compare strings, right? There's different scenarios in which you want to do this. So if you want to compare strings for the purpose of searching, right, or sorting, uh, this actually varies per language, right? If you want to compare strings, for example, if you have a user uh, identifier, right, uh, you do not want to vary this by language uh, because this gives all kinds of security issues. Um, um, but you do actually want to be a little bit more clever than just doing bitewise comparison, right? Like users can have uh, alternative spaces, they can have non-normalized strings and what have you. So there's also packages uh, recently added, for example, of the presses standard, which is uh, supposed to uh, replace string prep, uh, which can actually um, recognize this, right, and handle this properly. Um, and there's more packages to support this, so for example, against spoofing to, uh, you know, to handle this. So. The, the trickiest part maybe about using the text repo is to actually figure out which package to use, but you know, there's not that many, so hopefully that's not such a big burden. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, there's uh, several blog posts about internationalization. Rob made one about strings. Uh, I wrote one about normalization and uh, matching languages. Um, there's a recent proposal about uh, localization, so you can, and, and sort of translation and translation pipelines. You can read about it and see, you know, where it's sort of heading. And um, you can also look me up after this talk and ask whatever you want. Um, so, we have, as with the previous thing, we have just exactly one question, and we'll have to keep it brief, and we'll have to take other questions offline. Uh, volunteers, I see one hand up there. So first of all, thanks a lot for building this set. It's extremely complex, and I think you guys are solving a large problem for us. My question is how you're actually doing it. So for each language, do you actually have a switch case with a, with a giant switch case inside, or is there a tool engine, or a List yeah. no, no, organize all these rules? Yeah. No, it's, it's um, basically most of it is uh, table driven, right? So, so, th so the question was how do we actually do this? Is there a big switch case or is there you know, something else? So basically um, most of the data, not all of it, but most of the data is uh, retrieved from the CLDR database, which is basically a gigantic uh, XML file. Uh, from that we create uh, tables. So in many cases it's a, it's a try right, of some sort. So basically you take the text, uh, you look up the try, and then you do your text transformation. Um, and so, uh, the interesting thing about the try is that although we use UTF-8, so like a lot of the algorithms uh, assume you first convert to a code point and then convert back. So I often don't even do that, right? You just go from, from UTF-8 to new UTF-8 directly. So it never even gets converted. Um, but basically um, there are some exceptions, like for example for casing. Um, you know, like a lot of these examples are so esoteric, the way languages handle them, and there are like not that many of them, so it's easier to actually have separate codes for the, for the special cases. Uh, but most of the times it's, uh, it's table-driven. Yeah. 